Yo guys, welcome back to the Blue Podcast with me, Tom and Ben. Welcome to a little uh, segment we're going to do at the start of podcast where our guest isn't really a football YouTuber or likes to talk about football. So we're just going to put this in at the start so to talk about like we normally do the week that has just passed with football and the transfers and the results. So uh, I think first off, as it only happened yesterday evening, was it? Van der Beek, 40 million. Yeah. United's first signing of the se- uh, new season. Yeah, well, it's been agreed anyway, hasn't it? Yeah, it's just, it's the first proper signing, really, that they've made. Um, yeah, well, well, that's a good signing, isn't it? Decent signing. It's what they needed. Yeah, they need someone. And, and the two United fans that we've spoken to have said they need a winger, a centre mid and a centre back. So that's one out of three. Yeah, it's the whole thing. Though. They're going for left backs still. I don't get it. They've got, what was yeah. it, William and Shaw? Yeah, Williams is is right footed, so I think that's why. But. Maybe, but Shaw should Shaw yeah Shaw surely should be good enough at this point. Yeah, I think it's more backup, isn't it? Um, I guess. Uh, like Williams with him being right footed isn't. Is yeah. Quite up to it. Like he's more. He'd probably do better at right back, to be fair. Yeah, probably, probably. But um, yeah, I mean, Van der Beek will just make that. That three in midfield just yeah very good for United. I mean, I don't think they'll sign Sancho now that they've got Van der Beek. Yeah, I mean it's thought it's only forty mil, so they could still probably have the budget. Yeah, but it's just like um, was it last week? Adam said that the it's looking more like they're going to do smaller signings, but more of them than getting that single Sancho signing. Was that the week before? Uh, I can't remember now, but yeah, I guess. You could look at it that way, like it's the start of them doing that. Um, yeah, because they need another centre back. Yeah, sure. and I mean, mm. is Greenwood good enough to play up top and put Martial back on the wing? Maybe. I think. I think that. I think they're. Yeah, I think they're all good enough. <laughs> yeah, they are all good enough. Yeah, <laughs> yeah um, they're a fantastic front three. Um, but they missed out on that Gabriel or something like that. Well, he him, yeah. yeah, he said no. To, he actually said no to to United. I had that down a couple of weeks ago. He said no to United. It's a very strange one, that. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's City fan. If I had chosen to be United and Arsenal, I'd be going United every day of the week. Oh, for sure, for sure, same. But I mean, it must be that that the Arteta is, I think, might be perceived as a better manager. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess so. That thing of the two United fans have said that as well, haven't they? That. Yeah, Solskjaer. Solskjaer's a good fit because he knows the club and stuff, but as a natural, like, yeah. managing... Well, yeah, they, they've said every time Lampard's probably coach, the best manager. Like Lampard, Arteta, whatever. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, mean, I think the season will be the, the... will show that if he is a good, if he is a good coach and manager, they'll do well. Yeah. But if he's not, I, I think Arsenal and Leicester, if they get their signings, they want like Taki Fico, then... They're looking more. They, they could be behind them even. So yeah, it'd be interesting to see. Well, the um. Oh yeah, speaking of Arsenal, the uh, was it Charity Shield? Charity Shield. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Charity no, Shield no. was uh was two days ago. We were recording last, this on the Monday. Uh, I, I missed the the Arsenal goal because I was watching the uh, the Chelsea Brighton game. All right. And uh, it's a good goal though from from Aubameyang. Yeah, it was. And it looks like he's gonna stay. Yeah, that's very good for them. Yeah, it's almost like a signing that, though, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Keeping, keeping a Bamiyo. Um, but, but they're looking all right, Arsenal, to be fair. They are. Too. Looking with a lot Arteta. more solid. Yeah, with Arteta, they're an actual team. team. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but I saw a tweet and it was like, um, Klopp hates the domestic trophies that much that he deliberately put Brewster onto Mr. Penn or something like that. No, I feel bad for him though, because he was clearly yeah. put on for the for the pen and then he. Oh, yeah. uh... No, the person was joking because he, he always bends off the domestic trophies, doesn't he? Hates the well, yeah. hates it. They, like, they, they, lost, they lost it last season, didn't they? They lost the champion uh, community yeah, last season to City. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so I mean, could it be a repeat of the Liverpool season again? Have we lost it, or is this is this a bad sign for things to come? Oh, I don't know. It's a difficult game to really judge on because it's it. it I know it's like well, it's a trophy, but it's like 
it still is pretty much a friendly. So uh, I get that, but at the same time, I like I would want to win it. Yeah, yeah, no, no. I'm, like it's still a trophy, but hmm. to say that if you if you if you, it's one of those ones. It's, if you win it, you're like, oh, fantastic. Yeah. If you lose, you're like, whatever. It's friendly. Basically, yeah. the same the League Cup. You know what I mean? League Cup as better. League Cup's a, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, like, the same, same principle as in if you oh, yeah, win the League Cup, you're like, oh, fantastic. If you, if you go out, you're like, you know. yeah. It's like if you win the, the Charity Shield, the FA Cup, and the League Cup, and then you go, like, oh, I won, we won the treble. <laughs> it's like, no, you didn't. No, you didn't. <laughs> I think uh, United tried to do that, didn't they? Uh, <coughs> won the Europa League, uh, League Cup and Community Shield. Like, oh, yeah. Trouble. 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 And, uh, <laughs> we, when we won the domestic trouble, they were like, we won the quadruple. <laughs> we the <laughs> nah, nah. Well, uh, moving on from, from one side of Manchester, I guess, to the other. City planning colossal bid for Messi. No. It's not happening? It's there's a load of bollocks, all that stuff, I think. If you, you think? If, if we can't get him for free, I don't think we're getting him. You know? or, It'll be a lot of money to, to or, buy him. Or less than... Because they're saying that they could accept um, a bid like that's not his release clause. Mm. Um, so, um, but City won't... So unless they accept a bid under, what, 100 mil or something like that, then... Oh, yeah. But I don't think, if we can't get him on free, I don't think we're getting him, to be honest. Well, so will they go like PSG, Inter, maybe? Maybe. Or oh, they might come to a, a agreement. agreement that they could, he'll stay until the end of next season or something. Yeah, but Messi's, Messi doesn't even turn up to training. <laughs> yeah, no, that's what I mean. Like, they, they have to um, have a meeting and stuff. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's looking interesting. I think it's on Mon- oh, not Monday, on Wednesday, they're supposed to be having a meeting or something. Um, but, yeah, I think with with it. Like with his contract being ridiculous, with a fee involved as well, it's just it's just ridiculous, really. Yeah, um, but of all the clubs in the Premier League to have the funds. Yeah, yeah, I get that. Oh, I, I was like, so let's talk about that actually. Yeah. Um, but um, uh, yeah, I, I, no, nah. I mean, I can see, I can see something where because there's been like those bollocks things about us giving Bernardo Silva, Gabriel Jesus and... Um, yeah, I saw that, yeah. <laughs> Bernardo Mark. Silva, Garcia, Jesus. Yeah, I think the other one was Bernardo, Jesus and Mares. I was like... <laughs> there's no... no and then he explicitly came out and was like, we're not doing that. Yeah, with like... They said with Angelino and uh, Garcia, that's a different thing because... Two players on the out anyway. Two, two play, like Garcia wants to leave Barca and Barca are interested in Angelino, so... Works out, yeah. Like they, they could use them in the deal. Um, yeah, I mean, to be, to be fair, if you could, if you could give, get, take off, let's say, 30 million for Garcia, 30 million for Angelino, and then that's 100 million plus them. Yeah, I think that's... that's more reasonable... Yeah, I think that's a bit more fair. But uh, I, I could see something like that happening. But it's a lot of speculation. I still, yeah, I, I still think it's yeah a lot of it's bollocks at the moment. Fair um, but yeah, it's a uh, it's it's the thing. The thing with this transfer is that yes, it sounds weird. Like the best is one of the, well the best player in the world, if not the best. Hmm. But we need a centre back more than him because if we get him, you'll get anyone else. We're not, like, well, we're not getting anyone else, but we've already got a lot of quality in attack. So I don't think he won't change the way we play, like fundamentally. Unless... He will massively boost your squad to the next level. Yeah, and you're more likely to win a Champions League with Lionel Messi in your squad than not. Yeah, yeah, but I think. The way the the way he won't affect like sort of the way we attack or whatever like that. I understand what you mean, but but I'm I'm playing I'm kind of playing devil's advocate, obviously. But if you're let's say you're drawing nil nil in second yeah. leg of the Champions League, the player that's going to win you that game is Lionel. Yeah. yeah, no, I get I get that, but I mean, um, the, like what we really need is a defender, i.e. Kulubali, who will change the sort of not the way we play fundamentally but he'll 
change the dynamic. Yeah. Uh, so, so you're saying like, oh, what if you're in a Champions League second leg nil nil? With the current team we've got, it'll probably be Champions League second leg losing one nil. You know yeah, I, mean? I, get what, I get what you mean. Yeah, yeah. I understand. understand. So I'd, uh, at the moment, I'd, I know it sounds weird to say I'd rather have Kula Bali uh, first. If we get both, fantastic. <laughs> yeah, if we, if we get both, you are just like yeah, rubbing yeah. your hands together with excitement, of course. Yeah, but if, if I had to choose one or the other, probably Kula Bali first. But um, you wouldn't say no. I wouldn't say no, yeah. But I just, I just think. Yeah, you wouldn't change the way we play fundamentally unless we turn into Juve this season and start being over reliant on him like they've been with Cristiano Ronaldo. Pep wouldn't allow that. I don't think so. No. All right. Well, uh, enough talking about your club. I want to talk about Chelsea now. <laughs> I've seen a lot of tweets. There's been a bit of a bit of shade thrown at Chelsea recently, haven't there? Has there? Yeah. So there's been like a lot of tweets. So there's one where it was like. Um, it was a picture of City and a picture of Chelsea. It's like the media villain, the real villain. What for? Because you're spending, spending so much money. I know you. you I know people use the excuse of you have had sale and all that sort of stuff, but it still is a lot. We didn't spend any money yeah, yeah, yeah. for a full season with all the money we're getting well, from loans. This is taking it, not taking into account just this summer. It's taking into account when Chelsea started spending money. That's what it's. That's what it's saying. So they're saying, yeah. like, <clears throat> well, they can piss off. I don't they're care. Saying that City are getting a lot more flack. Than, this is more recent than Chelsea, but Chelsea should, should be getting just as much flack, sort of thing. I, I I'm gonna. Uh, I saw another thing where it was like Chelsea spent 180 on Ziyech, Havertz, not Havertz, a Ziyech, Werner, uh, Chilwell, Chilwell. And we spent 180 million on Aguero. Uh, like the Brian, Jesus, Mares, blah, blah, blah. But that was 10 years ago you got Aguero. Think about the, how much he'd be sold for now. Yeah, but that's, that's what I mean. It's taken into account. It doesn't matter how much it would cost now. It's taken into account the whole... Like, it doesn't matter what it was now or then. It's like... Why well, yeah, but you, yeah, but you, have, you, have to, you have to take in that <clears throat> factor, though. I don't know if you like because you could the only figure you can only take into account the actual. I know, I know, obviously, but I know, obviously, you can only take in that figure. But at the same time, the only yeah. reason we are able to spend the money we are this season. Yeah. But would you not say is, that's intelligent business? What uh, for us? No, no, from us getting in them. Oh, for sure, for yes, sure, it is. But, but but at the same time, like I'm not disagreeing. You did some fantastic business for Aguero, De Bruyne, and all them. Yeah, fantastic yeah. business but we are also doing fantastic business yeah. we got Werner for Morata yeah, yeah, yeah. we got Ziyech for yeah. less than that but do you still think that there's a do you think there's a valid thing with them saying oh, I understand what you I understand what they mean like, but at the same time I'm not gonna I don't really agree with it if I'm gonna be honest do you not, I, do not I, so. I, I get both sides completely yeah. do you not think that we deserve just as you deserve just as much flack as us then I feel like we should sometimes, but it's just literally, literally it's only because you did it more recently. Yeah, I guess, I guess, I guess. Whereas yeah. now we've just, we did, we did that hundred million in that, was it 2005, 2004? Yeah, something like that. We did that. Ridiculous. We got, we got, we got, a, we got a lot of stick for it then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But since then we haven't really had much from Abramovich in terms of transfer kitty from yeah. him. And I saw it's uh, on that actually. I saw another tweet. And it was like, "Yes, Ch City are one of the villains, but Chelsea uh, just as much of a villain because they are the team that started yeah. this investing." Yeah, I so, understand that. Um, it's like there's a there's a bit there's been a bit a bit of shade at Chelsea recently. Yeah, of course. Well, there's <laughs> always going to be part of, it, part of it is that people are like probably like a couple of. Not, not really City, but like... They're jealous. Yeah. They're pretty jealous. Much. Yeah, pretty much. I bet all United fans would... They can do what we've done, mm. but their owners won't. So they're annoyed at us because of their owners. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so... Mm, I don't know. The only thing that I would take from that is that I, I do think that Chelsea deserve just, deserve just as much flack as City. That's the only thing that I would say. But, I mean, you're a City fan. Of course you would. Yeah, but I think, I think 
but it's what the guy was saying last the podcast he was like the um rival fans opinions are valid mm. no. oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. like yeah it's not city fans saying that but i no, think, no. i think I, I i agree with what they're saying there no I, I i'm not disagreeing with what they're saying i can also just put points in oh yeah yeah no no i get that but like that's just what i'm doing yeah yeah i know but i just think uh out of all the things they're saying, like it's quite clearly because they're jealous, but I think that's the one valid point that they've said. Yeah, of course, of course. Yeah. I understand that. Um, but anyway, should we talk? Uh, well, did you see the any highlights of the Chelsea Brighton game? No, I didn't. I, I didn't know it was on until it was like there's a crowd. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously that that friendly will be most well remembered for because of the fact that it was the first game since yeah. lockdown that had a crowd. But I mean, obviously we drew. I mean, we gave away two penalties and we drew one all. I didn't even know that. Yeah, so we, we drew one all. They they got a penalty in like the last. I've just gone to the toilet and they got a penalty and I just missed it. But um, tell you what, Werner's got awesome. Tell you what, Ziek and Werner just look yeah. so good already. Ziek's pass for the goal, and just yeah. his entire the entire first half was. Uh, his yeah, I saw some of, like some of the clips of that, and it was decent. But like some of the some of the stuff Chelsea fans were putting, it was like he scored a thirty yard screamer. It was like no. fantastic first goal from Werner. Oh no, yeah, it's, it's, it's more the it's more the excitement that it literally yeah. took him four minutes. Yeah, it yeah, literally yeah. took him four minutes. Hudson and Doyle should have scored. <laughs> I saw someone say like. Hudson Odoi was so shocked that he got the service from ZX like that. <laughs> he didn't yeah. expect the ball, so he he messed up the header. And then obviously Werner was there to mm-hmm. to sweep up. But I mean, I thought I thought Werner's um, work rate was exceptional. That'll yeah, give you a, a different dynamic. Yeah, no, hugely. And, uh, Abraham's all right, but he doesn't. He's not Werner work like that. No, no. Like, he was literally like coming back in defence when he didn't need like properly putting a shift yeah, in. Yeah. And obviously, I'm going to be more excited because I'm a Chelsea fan. But yeah, yeah. I hope other people can see that there is reasoning behind my logic. <laughs> yeah, there is potential there. It's just yeah. like it was like some of, some of the Chelsea fan accounts is a bit of like over excitement, like it's yeah. going like forty you, yard screamer free kick. You do need to take a step. You do need to take a step back from yeah. it. But at the same time, if if you if you're a Chelsea fan, you look at it. ZX put a beautiful yeah. pass in to Hudson and Doy and Werner scored. If you're looking at it objectively at the two things, yeah, then obviously it's looking good. But has he yet got? I think he got injured uh, taking a free kick at the end of the first half. Yeah, it'll be like, um, oh yeah, it's, it's, it'll be nothing bad. We got 15, no, 12 days, I think, 15, 13 days now. Uh, till the. I thought you start later. Oh no, yeah, we got 15 days. Sorry, 15 days till. Um, Till our game, so he should be back by then. But he, he he injured himself taking a free kick, and it was such a nice free kick, and he curled straight like you know when it comes across the f- back of the defenders, mm-hmm. and Werner almost oh, headed it in. I thought I saw a clip. Uh, I think it was a United thing, and they were like, "Don't tell me that ZX is good as Bruno," and it's that he's like shanks it wide or something. <laughs> yeah, does he? I didn't think ZX took really to you know, like like he, his free kick on the right hand side and it goes left footed and he like tries to curl it in in cut in swerve like curling mm. and he like slices it and it goes out there and he's injured himself. I can't remember that. Oh. Yeah, yeah. I'll see if I can find it. But yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, fair enough. Anyway, um, have well, you seen have you seen the uh, the rumours that uh, Conte into Milan boss wants uh, Kante? I don't understand why Chelsea would sell him, but... I don't want to sell him. He's He was our captain against Brighton, for crying out loud. Well, I mean, I can see it happening, but I don't I don't understand why he would sell him. I don't think we, I don't, I don't think we will. I think it's just one of those, like, stories, hmm. like, it won't happen. It's too... He's too much of an important player yeah, when he's fit. Weren't, yeah, they weren't sure that Conte was going to still be manager, but I think they've thought that now. Yeah, I think they have. And, but yeah, that's a, it's a weird one. That's another one that's like just bollocks. Yeah, it is. It is. Um, well, you got any, any anything else happened recently that you want to talk about? Uh, or should we get into the uh, the juicy interview? Um, I think there's one other thing. Oh, I saw on that Britzio Romano thing that Havertz is pretty much done. Like, it sh- uh, should be today or tomorrow, yeah. 
yeah. Monday or Tuesday for everyone watching it on Thursday. Because uh, um, Bayer Leverkusen are already reinvesting it, buying that Patrick Schick off. Uh, yeah, I think they want to confirm the signing of him before they allow Chelsea to confirm the signing of Adams. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, uh, see you guys in two seconds to for the interview with Football Fanatics. I meant F1 Fanatics. Yo, guys, welcome to the Blue Podcast with me, Tom, Ben, and Mike from uh, F1 Fanatics. Uh, thank you guys for all the support lately, I have to say. I mean, we are uh, 240 subscribers. Uh, I certainly did not think we would be at this point uh, 13 weeks in now, so that's great. But 6% of all people that watch our videos are not subscribed, so make sure you hit that subscribe button. It is free, so why not? It helps us out a lot. We upload these Thursday at 4 p.m. every week. So if you don't subscribe, you can always check us out at that point. Check out the merch. <laughs> Link is in the description. Um, we, no one's bought any yet, but, you know, it's, uh, it's all right. <laughs> we just want people out there uh, getting the brand out there. And also go check out our Twitter at the Blue Podcast one and DM us if you want to get on. So, Mike, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm all right. Thank you, guys. Thanks for having me onto the podcast. And hey, yeah, someone's got to be the first to buy the merch. Surely, <laughs> yeah. you pump that across. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure the, the family are going to are buying some soon. They're just, uh, <laughs> just waiting around. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, of course, of course. But thanks for having me on, guys. No worries, mate. Um, so you're our, you're our second F1 guest. <laughs> if uh, we had uh, just, we had, um, oh, I said just John, that's his old channel. Um, <laughs> Motto, Motto Meerkat on uh, do you know him you, you've spoken to him before oh, I have indeed yeah actually just yesterday I uh, was recording a podcast with him for his um, oh. chat box oh, uh, yeah. stuff like that uh, but done a couple of videos with uh, Johnny Boy and uh, yeah he, he's great it's great fun so I'm sure you guys had a brilliant time chatting to him I think uh, you know him Tom is it yeah I went to school with him so I know him quite well so it was good yeah he's a good, good guy and uh, glad you. <laughs> just, I'll be watching the chat box when it's out. <laughs> um, all right. So the topic for this video is most iconic F1 seasons. So I mean, I've got a couple down. Uh, well, how about you guys? Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Um, yeah. I'll, yeah. A few kind of spring to mind. I mean, in seventy <laughs> years, I'm sure there's going to be a couple. <laughs> there be a few, couple of good ones. <laughs> yeah. um, with with uh, with John when we were doing the last ten years of F1, I I'm I'm, I'm not <laughs> I don't know F1. I'm gonna be honest. Ben's <laughs> Ben ben, know, Ben's, <laughs> ben knows more than me, so uh, I'll uh, I'll introduce the season what I know, and then uh, I'll I'll leave it to you guys to to teach me and everyone else. All right, so uh, should we start with oh which one should we start with? There's so many. Um, uh, we'll start with 1958 because I actually watched the, what's his name, Sterling Moss. Uh, there was a 58 minute thing on Sky Sports, which I watched this, watched this morning. Not Sky, it was a uh, Sky F1, as he died this year, didn't he? Yeah. Uh, Sterling he did. Moss. Yeah, yeah, sadly. So, uh, well, then there was it was a 10 round, 10 round season, five different winners throughout, throughout the 10 rounds, uh, three winners, one run, one round. Tony Brooks won three, but only finished four races. So he, he had no chance of, of winning, which is, I don't know how that happens. <laughs> I'm sure you guys will know more than me. Uh, but Hawthorne, the winner, only won one race. Yeah, I saw a bit about that. It was like, he was, the, just the, he was just the one that was consistent. Yeah, so, he, was, he was on podium seven times. So obviously, yeah, that's, yeah. Means the points add up. I mean... How do, how do, I don't really know how the points work. I'm sure you guys do. Well, it's changed over the years, hasn't it? Um, mm. I'm not sure how, how, they, how they worked back then. Uh, you probably you know, might, Mike? might know more. Uh, so basically back then, um, it, it was really weird. They, they kind of took your best average results. So I, I think even though it was a 10 round season, I think they only took your best six results. It might have been right. at six at that point or it might have been eight. So basically it was average and it, it was a weird thing with F1 because I think it even went up until the 90s uh, as far as that because uh, one of uh, probably one of the iconic ones you'll bring up with Prost and Senna is Prost actually outscored Senna in both of the seasons they were together at McLaren but because overall Senna had one more win he technically won the championship so 
it seems a bit of a bizarre way of doing things but yeah that's that's how Mike Hawthorne did it and actually uh, he, he was driving for Ferrari and one of his teammates um, Peter Collins who sadly lost his life uh, that year in the championship um, I think was going for the title as well so yeah it, it was uh, it, it was crazy and obviously the first ever British world champion and, and I don't think Mike really kind of gets the credit he deserves for doing that. Mm. Well, I was um, I was watching the thing this morning. There was uh, Sterling was saying like they him and him he was the obviously the person that was closest to him and lost lost the championship by one point that that year through the uh, the, the good what was it the good like what's the words I've forgotten the word now. Yeah, it's good, good sportsmanship. Good sportsmanship yeah, yeah, by yeah. saying yeah, that there we go. he was going to be disqualified for um for that for the fight was a final race that he did the the push start on the the oh. oh what was it I think the thing was the push start and you're not allowed to you weren't allowed to push start back then. I, I think what it was I'm not was it was, was it reverse last race but I think it was reverse? in Portugal. Basically, I think he was off the track. It, yeah. it was something uh, from there. And Sterling Moss, I, I think, had gone round and won the race, actually, yeah. that one. And he was on his, like, cool-down lap or finishing lap after that and saw Mike uh, on this and saw the whole incident happen. So, he, yeah, he went into the steward's office and basically said what you're trying to disqualify him for didn't happen. Because, obviously, yeah. we watch sports nowadays and there's camera angles literally yeah. everywhere. Mm. But, obviously, back in the 50s, uh, it was basically just kind of relying on word of mouth type thing, but um, yeah, yeah. it was it, it was fair essentially what yeah. happened. It was uh, one of the biggest bits of um, sportsmanship with an uh, F1 history. Because mm, I mean, I think I, I think almost nowadays you probably wouldn't wouldn't get that, would you? With uh, most sports, maybe. Uh, Do you think? I don't know. Of that, he, like he literally won, lost the championship by one point, and he, if yeah. he hadn't gone into that I and know. said the competition, so uh, I don't know, if, some pride involved, I, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Because yes. obviously, when I was speaking to you and John about it, that I found found out how many how, how many egos are involved in, in F one nowadays. Mm-hmm. So it's it's interesting to see that happen, and. Um, it's quite an interesting season, really. Obviously, to mm. to be to be decided by by that. Um, all right, let's talk about. Is there anything else you want to talk about for that season? Uh, no, I, I think we're good on that. In terms of, I think the only thing to kind of reiterate your point is what you have to go. I, I don't think they do it nowadays because we're talking about there is literally like millions and millions yeah. of pounds yeah. on the line where back then it was like the gentleman era of F1, where it was basically a load of rich boys going racing. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, they they were kind of quite nice mates with each other. And mm. the guy, Peter Collins, who died, although him and Mike Hawthorne were rivals and teammates within the team, they were kind of like best mates. So they were always uh, encouraging each other to do their best, which I don't think really necessarily happens in today's mm. sporting world. Mm. Well, actually, that reminds me of uh, something that Sterling Moss said in the, the interview we had before he died. He, he, he almost can't say that people like Hamilton and Vettel nowadays are as good as the racers back in the 50s, 60s, because back when you raced back then, you could die at the next race, whereas nowadays every car is built, unless a tyre hits you in the head, then you're, you're going to be safe pretty much whatever speed you crash at, which is... Which is, I thought was quite an interesting point from him. Yeah, I mean, it's there's still the, the the threat's still there, but like you say, back in in the past, it was there was a very real risk that each race you could die. Like mm-hmm. now, it's now there's still that risk there, but obviously it's a lot more reduced. Um, so, I mean, there's that point where you can't really compare because the cars have changed so much mm-hmm. as well. So. You, you, there's not really you can't really be like well he's just as good as him when they're in completely different sort of cars like fair enough in, in a very literal sense hmm. yeah what do you think of that mike i well obviously uh your guys is more of a football background isn't it with the <laughs> um 
with, with the podcast is, is it's a bit like, you know, when people try to compare Maradona, Pele, you know, mm. those likes to the Messi's, Ronaldo's, you never truly know. And I, I don't think the greatest of all time just basically means for people like us who do podcasts and videos on sport, just it's a great like opinion piece because we won't yeah. definitively know, uh, y- you know, in these things because there are so many different circumstances that come into it. But yeah, I think it was an interesting point about uh, they certainly are a lot safer now today. Obviously, you know, recently is the anniversary of Antoine Huppert's death in Formula 2 just last year. So it is a very real possibility that people mm-hmm. can still die. But there's a great uh, movie actually called Race uh, to Immortality about Ferrari and F1 during the 1950s, uh, which ends covering that 1958 season with Mike Hawthorne winning, um, but goes all through the 50s. And I think they had like five of Ferrari's top drivers died during that time. And I think about 30 might have died in total just between 1950 and 60, which is mental. Can you imagine like 30 yeah. footballers dying in a game? No, uh, yeah, that is bonkers. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That it's is crazy. Number. Now. If, if oh, yeah. that many people were dying, like that, a percent, that much. Uh, that much of a percentage of the races were dying now they'd just be like right something's not right like something's not working mm. but, but like that then there's just health and safe, safety was nothing so you know yeah. that was a, that was an interesting point uh, you know your numbers mate you know your numbers um <laughs> i'm gonna jump around a bit with the seasons i know it might be a bit confusing for you guys but I, i'm kind of trying to do it in terms of interest so we're going to build up to some of the more interesting ones um let's say 1986 last race Mancelli Sarli I don't know how Sarli's certain title was lost as his rear tire exploded giving his teammate Nelson PK I PK oh, you've, you've nailed that one you've nailed <laughs> that one but you've got the British man Nigel yeah, Mansell's no, name right Mansell <laughs> Uh, you never thought that one massively. Uh, <laughs> anyway, what do you guys think of that race? Fine, got it. Sorry, going. No, I, I'm, I was just saying I, I didn't have too much written down on this race, but obviously it's quite um, was championship even. But I, I say, I mean, nowadays you obviously wouldn't get a uh, a championship that comes down to the last race where literally a blown tire causes. Cause of the championship. Not to be recent, recent, but I mean, there has been some more recent that have been down. Yeah. But you wouldn't get you. I mean, you wouldn't get the puncture. But you, know, you might, you might actually. You just never know what's going to happen. But mm. yeah, you wouldn't get it down to the last race for like past. I don't know. Eight to ten years. Yeah. So. Is that, that's a little hint for, for future future championships I've written down. Uh, yeah. Well, so what's your view on that, Mike? Uh, that Yeah, that is an iconic moment. Um, Nigel Mansell obviously won a championship in 1992 with like a dominating Williams, but it, he's he's one of the kind of best guys to only win it once. Like the guys in the 80s, the PKs, Mansells, uh, Senna's, Prosts, they were really the kind of cut above the rest. But uh, that Honda powered Williams that year was the far superior car but it kind of been PK and Mansell fighting it out all year and Prost in the McLaren which was still a decent car uh it's kind of there but yeah both I think PK also got a puncture in that race which allowed Prost to take the victory um and yeah it's just a dramatic end to the season I think everyone it's a bit like you know getting a last minute winner or uh scoring in penalties a bit like the Liverpool uh, come back with AC Milan in uh, yeah. 2005. Hey, you know your you know, it... stuff, mate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm just throwing it in there, yeah. But I... You're sprinkling <laughs> some more knowledge in there. I I, I've got to mix it. I've got to keep the football crowd <laughs> interested as well, relevant. But yeah, it's that's the kind of dramatic moments, isn't it? And you just go, you feel sorry for the guys because Mansell was just always so uh, blistering quick. And that was one of the biggest criticisms of him. Hmm in his early career was he just drove the car flat out and like the the Prost, the Louders, the Hamiltons nowadays, they kind of drive the car within the limit yeah. and do what they need to do with victory where Mansell just wanted to go as fast as he could every lap, 
which sometimes resulted in uh, dramatic crashes and in this case uh, a puncture but it, it was an unfortunate end but a very kind of good victory for Prost as well yeah you it, tend to find that um, like obviously I guess well for me personally you love to see like the drivers who just go for it like like you say Senna and blah 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 but like it's, it's usually the way it goes in the rivalries that you'll have one that just goes all out and you have the one that's like really tactical and like really thinks about it. I've forgotten what, um, is it Prost, was he called the professor? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, Cause he, with Prost, um, I'm like, I remember my, cause my dad was into F1 and he says that with Prost, he's, if he had to come forth in a race, he would come forth. Like, well, not obviously he wouldn't like just deliberately stay forth, but he would, make sure he came forth at least mm. like he wouldn't push himself to in, then lose that fourth place he would just like but with like you say Mansell Prost they would just go for it and that's what you want to see really but that's mm. what makes the rivalry is interesting because there's these different sort of approaches I think yeah I ab- absolutely agree on that one it's you know as fans you, you always want to see uh, and, you know, the guys pushing to the limits and the entertaining ones, the, the Senna and Mansells are kind of uh, massively there. Their highlights clips will be better than a uh, Prost highlights clip, but yeah. Prost won more than both of them and was higher statistically in all of them apart from pole positions, uh, which obviously Senna has over Prost. So, yeah, it's too, it is the kind of, it's crazy, isn't it? It's like having the workman like uh, midfielder <laughs> and I'd just bringing that football back in, but obviously the flary uh, kind of creative midfielder as well. They both kind of have their strengths and weaknesses and both can be successful, but hey, I, I suppose it's what you make of it, what you got. Yeah. Mate, you are smashing these football analyses. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, let's jump, I guess, to my most recent uh, championship I've got down, 2012. Uh, first seven races were won by seven different drivers from five different teams. And I guess, I think obviously with this season, you would just never, you wouldn't get that. Mercedes would obviously be there or Ferrari. But I mean, five different teams with seven different winners is almost crazy. What do you guys think of that? I don't know. I don't know who won it in the end. I didn't write that down for some reason, but... (laughs) that literally the last F1 podcast. I know, I know, that, I know I did, I know I did. I <laughs> know, <laughs> uh, that was um, Vettel. Oh, hey. bad, look, you've nailed it, he's pulled it out of the bag. Vettel, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, I, I, I've got a picture of memory, so I, because you know, I had that list of everyone that had won it in the last 10 years, I was like, Vettel, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I um, mean, obviously you guys probably remember this one, because I mean, this is 2012 was the year that Chelsea won the Champions League, so it's very memorable, <laughs> very memorable year for me. But um, the, the, uh, yeah, the Aguero scored and we won the Prem, so exactly. So this is this is a very <laughs> momentous thing. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway, Mike, I'm sure you you, mem- you must remember this season, I guess. Yeah, yeah you arguably could be top of the list in this most iconic F1 seasons. Uh, it just kind of had a bit of everything. Yeah, like had that. Uh, brilliant start to the season there were just some absolutely crazy races in it I think it was Mercedes first win since their return to the sport with Nico Rosberg in China uh, had a kind of second race of the season was like um, a really good battle between Alonso and Perez the young Mexican obviously he's now an experienced guy within the sport now uh, in the Sauber which traditionally has been a lower down team so that was kind of crazy a mistake at the end couldn't quite capitalize on it Fernando Alonso was actually the guy uh, first guy to be able to uh, win twice in that season and I think Pastor Maldonado who's become a bit of a meme figure um, within the kind of F1 world for being blisteringly quick at times but also being a bit crash happy yeah. and well actually pretty much the race after in Valencia I think it was uh, or it might have been two races after in Valencia um, after winning the Spanish Grand Prix, he then crashed into Hamilton uh, near the end of the race as well, which kind of basically sums up his career. 
But yeah, it was, it was a down to the wire battle between Alonso and Vettel. Really good. Went to the last race. Um, Vettel spun at the start, looked out of it, and then worked his way through the field to get enough points to win the championship. It was, it had everything really that year. Fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> he wants to listen in on our, on our F1, F1 chats. <laughs> Oh, this is my dog. Oh, is your dog? Oh my god, I'm so deaf. <laughs> Slink out of here. Um, oh yeah, actually, that reminds me. I don't know. If, uh, make sure to check out the merch. We have got dog hoodies. Yeah. I know my grandma's going to buy buy one for my uncle and aunt's dog. So I make sure you <laughs> check them out. They are good quality, I have to say. Um, all right, let's move on to. I'm going to go with 1982. 11 different winners from seven different manufacturers. I'm kind of building on the, the different winners here. Um, unfortunately, uh, Gilles Venin. I'm up. Gilles oh. Villeneuve. Gilles Villeneuve. <laughs> He's, it, it's French, that. so it's a little bit dodgy. <laughs> so he unfortunately died that, that season. And uh, Ricardo Palais. Palais? Uh, Patrese. P A L E double T I. P. Oh, Palais, yeah, yeah. Okay, Palais. Yeah, Palais. yeah, Ricardo Palais and Didier Peroni had uh, unfortunately career ending accidents. What do you got? Let's take of that. <laughs> Ben's got his dog. <laughs> as, <laughs> just as he's frozen. <laughs> oh, no, he's frozen. In. All right, so I'll, I'll take over on 82. 82, yeah, was. It was a bit like the championship that nobody wanted to win and was kind of, uh, like you said, marred by a tragedy with, you know, a lot of deaths within the sport. I think there were um, protests within it as well. I can't remember. Was it the Spanish Grand Prix or Dutch Grand Prix before? But basically, Ferrari were bossing this as Renault's both retired and they thought there was team orders between Didier Perone and Gilles Villeneuve. Uh, Peroni in Gilles' mind, ignored these team orders, won the race. Gilles vowed never to speak um, to Peroni ever again. And then next week in qualifying, uh, had this crash, and it's a horrific crash, uh, that he lost his life. And Peroni, I think, was going to probably go on and win the championship. But a couple rounds later, yeah, he had a career-ending crash. And then sadly, he was looking to make a recovery of some sorts. Um, but he got into speedboat racing when he couldn't get into cars and had a fatal accident and died uh, in a speedboat accident as well. So, yeah, that season's kind of sad for a lot of mm -hmm. F1 fans, a uh, thing. But it was won by Keke Rosberg uh, and Williams' second ever Drivers' World title and his only one. And obviously, dad to Nico Rosberg, who won it in uh, 2016. Mm -hmm. Do you remember that? Do you remember 82, Ben? Well, do you know of eighty two? Uh, well, I know of it, but I'm like, uh, I'm not really as much of an expert on the uh, like going past, like I say, probably nineteen ninety maybe. Fair enough. Fair enough. Oh, yeah, you, there's a race you must know about, which I'll speak about later. In uh... yeah, well, I mean, I'm, obviously, I know like the, the well, you probably go on to the, this that season in a minute, but um, yeah, it's more and more I know the stuff like about those seasons through my dad. Sort of thing. Yeah, of course, of course. Yeah. yeah, fair enough. Um, I'm going to jump back even further than the, the special race, which I haven't mentioned yet. 1964, looked like a fight between BRM Graham Hill and Lotus's Gion Clark. Is that, have I said that right? I'm, uh, I'm on the ropes with this one. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've no idea. Look, you're, you're pulling out a big season here. 64, God. I don't even know... Uh, Graham Hill win that year? Hey, I haven't finished it. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it looked like a fight between Graham Hill and uh, Gion Clark, but Hill won the first round, Clark won the second and the third, and I've then stopped writing my notes, so I have no idea who won that. So that's uh, obviously they don't. They obviously they don't <laughs> win. <laughs> I have bottled that. I'm really sorry. Did you get a bit bored? <laughs> I was doing a lot of research. I was watching, I was watching, as I said, documentaries and interviews. 
I was trying to get into it, but I've obviously just okay. Scrap sixty four. <laughs> <Let's> <laughs> sixty four, it's gone. Sack it off. Uh, you guys obviously uh, yeah. remember. I've got it. I've got it. He's got it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. if you don't remember, it can't be that iconic, can it? Don Thirties <laughs> won it. Who oh, won did it? he? Okay, so that's iconic because I I knew he was around back then. So he is the only person to ever win a world championship on two and four wheels. So. He had a career that he started in the motorcycle world. And I think he won, uh, I think, three or four world titles in that. And this one he won with Ferrari, but had a falling out with Ferrari due to Le Mans was the big race at the time. And he was dropped from a seat. And so he kind of left Ferrari and never really had much of a career after that. But yeah, he, uh, he won the championship that year and remains the only man in history to have won a world championship in, on four wheels and two wheels. Ah. Very interesting. Well, when you first when you first started saying uh, won a championship on two wheels, I was like, did he not finish the race with uh, two <laughs> wheels or something? <laughs> yeah. I've recovered that for you, Tom. Thank, thank, thank you, Ben. Thank you, Ben. But again, it was doesn't seem to be of to have been that iconic because I mean, if Mike doesn't if Mike doesn't know it really, then uh, <laughs> uh, who does? He's he's. <laughs> I, 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 I like I've now been given the kind of title. If I don't un- know about the season, it's not iconic. Yeah? It's, 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 I've, I've ruined. I've ruined John Settees's uh, championship. It's not iconic. <laughs> we got that. We got that fancy fact at least. <laughs> yeah, we did get the fancy facts at least. Um, I've got I've got two left. Obviously, you guys can mention any others that I probably have forgotten or not found. I'll go with 2010 first. Uh, led by six different drivers at different stages of the championship. And Vettel only topped the table after winning the last race of the season. Vettel was one of four who could have won the championship at the start of that final race, which obviously I'm guessing. I don't know much, but I can imagine that's quite incredible. You can only dream of that happening now. You can only dream. Oh. <laughs> what does it happen? But like, it will happen again, but not for a bit. Um, but yeah, like I, I think that's it's the main. Well, I don't really know um, a lot about, well, enough about it. But I think from what I've seen, it's the main debate at the moment in F1 with Hamilton and Mercedes. Oh, here comes the. This is this is kind of like a running joke in in the in the podcast. <laughs> the, ben, the the internet <laughs> going. Back. Yeah, he's back. <laughs> I'm back. Yeah. Uh, where, where was uh, you said that that's the debate um, about oh, Hamilton and Mercedes. Yeah, that um, everyone wants there to be competition like it, there was back then. Um, and obviously, I think Hamilton came out and was saying about um, he, he understands himself as because he was a fan when Schumacher was doing the same, basically, of what it feels like. But for him, uh, actually being in the car it's different because he can like look at what Bat- Bottas is doing and look at his own signs blah blah blah, blah. so he- he's finding it good that way but for the fans it's like just the same every every race but yeah um, but I think that's the main debate going on about wanting there to be more competition basically <laughs> they wish it was 10 years ago again basically yeah. <laughs> basically on that front <laughs> Uh, so, Mike, do you, you know, I'm guessing you obviously know about this race. Well, this yeah, yeah, season. it was it was a great season actually. Uh, well, it, it, it's an interesting one because it just the races weren't necessarily too exciting that season. They they generally tended to be comfortable. One, there was obviously some great moments within it, but it was the fact that it was just so unpredictable. Like Red Bull was had their first season of kind of. Uh, well, 2009 and the second half of the season, they'd come on strong. But this is the first time they kind of looked like they had a car to compete for a championship. Ferrari had just got their first year with Fernando Alonso in the car. And then McLaren had the kind of dream British partnership of Jensen Button, who had just won the championship in 2009, and Lewis Hamilton, who was world championship in world champion in 2008. And so, yeah, it was so exciting going through. And I think... Only a couple of rounds before uh, Jensen Button was mathematically impossible to compete, having, I think, led the championship early doors. Um, but I believe the favourite uh, going into the race was actually, um, well, the two probably preferred candidates, 
were Fernando Alonso and uh, Mark Webber, but both got caught behind Vitaly Petrov on a poor strategy call by Ferrari, which uh, for modern F1 fans know that that isn't necessarily something unusual to happen. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, Sebastian Vettel hadn't led the championship at any point up until that season till, uh, you know, taking it in the last race, which was incredible for him. Mm. I can imagine. I mean, that that's that's we, unheard of, I'm guessing. We, we've Someone, got, go on. Uh, we've sort of got in the last uh, F1, but was that the podcast, was that the season that Button won Canada? Or was that a, a later that, season? That was the season after, where okay. that's one of the most iconic races, certainly of the last decade, which was, yeah, Canada 2011. That yeah. was a brilliant race where he basically had six pit stops or, well, or went through the pit six times and somehow managed to win a mental yeah. race. Yeah. Uh, I always remember that one. It's, <laughs> whenever we talk about that, this sort of era, that always comes to mind because uh, it was so iconic. Mm. Um, yeah. Fair enough. Well, uh, going from one iconic race to uh, probably the most iconic championship due to Rush, I guess I'm guessing as well. Hunt versus Loud Lord. Louder. 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 Uh, 1976. Yeah. Uh, most famous for most famous race, would you both say, or championship even? Uh, right. It's definitely up there. I think 1989. Uh, with Prost and Senna well the 88-89-90 seasons with Prost and Senna is iconic as well with the rivalries um, in terms of that and the other ones are covered but yeah 1976 obviously it's been immortalised in the film Rush in terms of that there's been other kind of film adaptions of it but it, it was just I think it was because that season itself probably wouldn't have been remarkable uh, if Lauda hadn't have had, obviously, that near-death experience at the Nürburgring. Well, I missed two uh, races, right? He he missed, I believe, three races, three I think. Races. And then came back in the fourth round and got a fourth place in Monza and was a little bit there. But, yeah, basically, you know, it, it was fighting, but Lauda would have easily won that year without that um, uh, crash, certainly, in my opinion. So... It was that crash made it, the comeback story, and then obviously losing it on the last race. And James Hunt, obviously, somehow in those horrible conditions, finding a way to, uh, I think he had to get up to fourth or third. It was one of them uh, in terms of that. But yeah, I, it's just iconic because it was a brilliant friendship as well. And I think that was, you know, th they really respected each other and they were completely polar opposites. And yeah, just both brilliant drivers. Yeah. When you're saying polar opposites, do you mean like the way that they drive or their personalities? Both. Both. Yeah, absolutely both in terms of that one. The James Hunt was absolutely a party boy. I'll throw in another football um, analogy in terms of George Best would probably be the best way to kind of compare James Hunt in terms of that character and both drunk themselves to an early grave, uh, probably. Um, on that front and Nicky Lauda was the very kind of methodical intellectual uh, understood wanted to understand the setup of the car relentlessly spent all the time with the mechanics probably was the first driver to really ins understand the car inside out he probably wasn't the quickest driver on the grid but he just knew how to get the best car and understood that it wasn't just to be the quickest driver it was getting the best kind of average between car and driver. So, uh, yeah, that's that's why they're kind of polar opposites, but they both massively respected each other. Mm. I've noticed and with the, the earliest championships, obviously there were a lot of big rival, rivalries, but all these people seemed almost off the, off the track, very close friends. And I'm guessing that's obviously, that's changed nowadays. Uh, I mean, you still you still see. I think uh, it probably has changed a little bit, but I mean, you still see like um, I think it was on Sky F1 recently. Ricky Ardo was doing an interview, and Lando Norris came past, and they had a bit of a like a joke and stuff. So they, they still are like 
mates, but like, yeah, they're probably not as close as they, they used to be. Uh, I don't know what you think about that. I, I think I think it's probably the way that modern sport goes with being in the best championship. Uh, in terms of they have to kind of almost be so clinical and so well media trained and everything. And they probably are quite good mates behind the scenes, but we don't see that as much uh, because it was so relaxed where, and I'd say the same with kind of premiership footballers. If you listen to kind of old guys who used to play at the start of the premiership or the old kind of league one um, top division in terms of there, they would walk down to the ground with the fans I think almost they, they'd be parking on the streets and you know you'd hear those stories and it'd be quite a close relationship between players and fans and I think it was the same in F1 you know the paddock was quite open it was very open there it was it was kind of quite a close-knit group and I also think that understanding that they might go into that race and they might not come out of that race was almost a close bond they they all realized they were kind of absolutely mental maniacs stepping into death traps and mm -hmm. that was almost like a uniting brotherhood type thing mm -hmm. well we've um, we've spoken quite a bit about the uh, the football side that has changed on the podcast recently um about how back in the 90s of the noughties uh players would put everything on the line for their team and the the passions slightly left football in terms of the teams. I mean, some teams obviously still have it, some players still have it, but the rivalries and it's obviously has changed a lot. So it's uh, interesting to link that to, to F1 nowadays. It well. goes to what Mike was saying about sport, modern sport being more clinical. Yeah. That's, I think that's key. Massive. Uh, but it, uh, yeah. Um, on the 1976 season i think um i think films are crack uh, rush is a cracking film um, mm. and, um but the fact that he was it, i think i've forgotten what his diagnosis was or whatever but the fact that he got back into the car after only a matter of weeks with the injuries that he had is ridiculous i, I think i heard a story that he was pulling the balaclava on and when when he finished the race he, he would just be dripping in blood because he, he's injuries were still not healed it, it's mind-boggling you must have so much passion yeah you know, um, you know what i mean mm -hmm. yeah, yeah it was mental absolutely crazy that drive it but that's that's the kind of level of competition that james hunt drove him to and how he respected mm -hmm. him as a rival because it, if he didn't have someone pushing him and winning races that he yeah. thought he could yeah. win going there, I don't think he would have done it. It's just, uh, he, he kind of was a little bit insane in terms of he didn't want James Hunt to win. So he wanted to get back in a race car. Yeah, I think as well, it's like mind blowing uh, the numbers of sort of the the fire that he was actually caught in. Was it something like a few thousand degrees or something ridiculous? You just, you just can't mentally like picture it. I don't, you know, I don't, like you just can't put it into your head. So, like, I don't know. It's, it's ridiculous. Yeah, it, it, it's mental. He was literally in the middle of like a flame, a, a fire that was being fueled by literally engine fuel. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, it, it combusted combusted into flames and you know if it wasn't for um you know the drivers who stopped by and pulled him from the car mm. easily he would have died just yeah. through there and it actually wasn't the burns itself that were too worrying it was it was the kind of chemicals that he inhaled through the fire that majorly screwed up his lungs which i think eventually you know, many years on luckily for him he was able to live a good life that obviously he sadly passed in 2019 um, but yeah, it was a consequence of the injuries from that accident. Yeah, I think you've see, you see that a couple of times in the past, where drivers, like a driver's injured or something, or and they get other drivers get out of the car and to go and help them. Uh, I don't, I don't know what uh, moment it was, but I've seen that happen a few times. I think did Senna do it? I can't remember. Um, but I know 
Um, it's happened a couple of times in the past, but it happened, it happened, yeah. to, it happened to Sterling as well. But he had his, um, I think he had his, it was his second crash. I think people go out of the car for him as well. Right. Okay. So yeah, um, but yeah, again, obviously it's a, a circumstance of the cars being a lot better during crashes, but I don't think you get that now. Um, but yeah. Fair enough. Are we, uh, Mike? Is there any other the championships that we have not mentioned that you can think of? No, I, I think we've covered everything. Uh, what I would say uh, would be it was an iconic rivalry, an iconic championship, just for a few reasons. Uh, well, eighty nine and ninety because both went down to like the penultimate round in Suzuka, and both were marred by controversy because in eighty nine Prost basically took Senna out of the race. And Senna was disqualified in a very kind of um, dodgy fashion from that race. And then a year later, uh, Senna was peed off about getting pole position. He needed to kind of be ahead. It's so difficult to overtake at Suzuka. Um, he wanted to be ahead on the first corner. But the they changed pole position to the dirty side of the track, which basically means there's a dirty side and clean side of the track when you start a race. And on the cleaner side, you, you're you more likely to get a better start. And he was lined up against Prost in the Ferrari at that stage. And basically, Prost was leading the corner and Senna didn't break. He just basically <laughs> drove full pace into him at turn one. And they were both basically lucky to walk away with their lives and basically unharmed from the accident. Because I think they made contact at like 170 mile an hour. Something mm. stupid like that. Oh, and... Yeah. Yeah, but so those, those were iconic moments and one of the most iconic rivalries of all time, like Lauda and Hunt is as well. Yeah, I, I forgot about that that, that, that moment. I, I remember watching it. Because he literally, he doesn't, it's not like he just like clips him or anything. He literally smashes into him and they just get out of the can like, right. <laughs> Which won in the championship. But it's mental. It's literally like, you know, if we were mucking about on a racing game together. Yeah, and like, yeah, we jokingly take each other out. Apart yeah. from they actually did it in real life, and you're like going, "What the hell are you doing?" Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, it was a bit it, the the previous season. It was a bit sly, wasn't it? What Frost did, but um, so I, I can understand. There's probably a bit of that, bit of that in his in uh, Senna's head as well. Um, oh, and he's frozen. I mean, <laughs> Oh, um, yeah. He's back. He's back. Oh, we're back. We're back. <laughs> I mean, it's, yeah. I mean, it's um, yeah. It's it's one of them where like you can sort of understand it, even though it's ridiculous what he did. You can you can see the the motivations behind it and the uh, the mm -hmm. thought process. Mm. Definitely, they were just two ultra competitive guys who were the best of the time in the best cars. And they they wanted to win something that, you know, only a few few people have ever done, which is win uh, a Formula One world title. Yeah. Fair enough. I mean, uh, who who did end up winning that championship in the end? Uh, Eighty nine was won by Prost. So they both, by both resulting to take out each other, they did essentially what they were meaning to do, which was win the championship. So Prost won eighty nine, and Senna won ninety. Okay. Fair enough. So uh, clearly a plan behind everything. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, um, I guess that's, that must be it on the, the, the classic iconic championships that we've gone through. Hopefully people who've watched this have uh, learned something. I certainly have. Um, but let's start talking more about you, Mike, and, you, and your views on things. Uh, I've got a couple of questions here. Um, I think Ben kind of touched on it a bit earlier with the... Um, Hamilton and Mercedes, but do you think Hamilton is Hamilton and Mercedes are that good? That they they're just that good, or is the competition behind them just not good enough right now? Uh, it's a mix of both. Uh, I think there's no doubt Lewis Hamilton is one of the best drivers of all time to compete in the sport, and I think Mercedes are the best team uh, ever, or mm -hmm. at least over a consistent period, uh, been the most consistently best team of all time within the sport yeah. they'll break the record this year because i don't see that i think you can pretty much write it off at this stage that they'll win seven 
consecutive constructors championships and consecutive drivers titles which has never been done in the sports history before so they are good but also ferrari with a budget that can match mercedes have fluffed it and blown opportunities and red bull haven't got close enough either so yeah it, it, it's a mixture of both on that one mercedes has been so good but it's also a letdown that the other teams haven't found a way to challenge them in the past six years well seven years now fair enough um well yeah to speak on him probably being the greatest one of the greatest drivers of all time and beating schumacher what do you think he will do after he beats schumacher Good question. I, I, I don't actually know because Lewis Hamilton is a guy who has uh, interests outside the sport. He's not the type of guy, he's not like, uh, I'll use a Chelsea example <laughs> for you. Um, he, he's not like Frank Lampard who kind of lives and breathes football. Obviously, yeah. he's, he's finished his career, loved it with Chelsea. He's gone and got his coaching badges and gone his career there. Lewis Hamilton does love the sport but he's more of a guy, he also has a massive interest in fashion and he goes to kind of fashion events and I, I think works with Tommy Hilfiger uh, to release a special range uh, that's like the Lewis Hamilton range. And also in music, I think, I can't remember the artist. What's his name? Uh, I don't, I he's, got, he's got a funny name, hasn't he? Yeah, I, I think he was on a Christina Aguilera track. Um, ben okay. I can't remember it off myself. No, no. But basically, music's a massive interest for him mm. uh, as well. So I, I can see him maybe pursuing something in that. And obviously, he's been a very vocal supporter of Black Lives Matter during this time. And uh, for diversity... The Chadwick, so, so, the Jack, yeah, Chadwick so maybe, recently. Yeah, he, he's maybe trying to, obviously, uh, go into something a little bit more political or globally reaching outside of the sport of F1. Yeah, well, he is, he is sort of um, a star outside of F1 a bit. I guess you can compare him to a bit, maybe not on the same level, but a bit like David Beckham. Yeah. That he's got, he's a star, but outside of his respective sport um, and he's got interest in many other things. So, yeah, you just don't know what he's going to do. Fair enough. Um, well, we've spoken a lot about F1 so far. Maybe let's start talking more about your YouTube career. Um, I've got a couple of questions here. Uh, ben will ask you some as well. What event or person inspired you to get into YouTube? Uh, it's weird. I'm not entirely sure whether there was like any inspiration one. Um, I was, I was thinking of foot one. I kind of like the idea of uh, obviously what Robbie does with uh, AFTV um it's kind of like a fan channel for formula one because i mm. didn't think there was kind of that side element and being an arsenal fan uh myself that's probably what i looked at and i know obviously it comes into a lot of criticism and i know a lot of fans outside of arsenal enjoy watching it especially when the likes of kind of troops or dt have had absolute meltdowns <laughs> uh, on there or clawed with like if the fridge milk has gone stale you don't put it back in the fridge or whatever it was <laughs> you know those type of things which kind of got away with what he wanted but what he's now turned the channel into i think is quite a really good uh fan channel i think what uh, it, it's something really useful that any kind of club uh would kind of like to interact as fans because as fans you know football sport whatever we just love talking about it all the time. So that was probably the main inspiration in terms of a sporting background. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, you, I was about to say, you know, fans love to chat. That is literally what this podcast was created for. <laughs> so uh, fair enough. Uh, ben, you got a question? Uh, yeah. So, um, well, like, well, in previous in the previous podcast, um, talking to Tom and uh john um they were saying that they've made multiple channels before they've settled on the current one are you the the same or is this just like you went straight into this one and it clicked straight away sort of thing yeah this this was the first one in terms of venture just kind of jumped straight in with it but i suppose 
probably been like John's younger, isn't he? He's around about uh, so probably 20. your age, Tom, isn't he? So yeah, yeah 20. 20. So I'm 26 and soon 27. So I was just like, I oh, just wanted to talk about F1. It was literally a debate between football and F1. And I was like, man, it's, it's quite a load of stuff on football. And obviously, Arsenal as well has the biggest fan channel. <laughs> so to kind of go up against that would probably be a little bit where F1 was kind of quite quiet as a scene. It's grown quite a lot massively in the last year. But uh, yeah, this, this is the first one. Fair enough. Um, oh, I was about to say something about that, but I forgot. Not, not got like 10 <laughs> channels like you. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't had 10. I haven't had 10. <laughs> but, um, well, yeah, but me and John have, I think, this this year. I mean, John actually kind of inspired me to kind of, because obviously he he's a massive fan of F1 mm-hmm. motorsports. And uh, what I'd done in the past, he'd done in the past, was more kind of the typical YouTube channels if that makes sense you know like the ice that the chili challenges or that kind of mm. crap <laughs> putting it politely <laughs> but um no yeah, it's, it's made me decide that this is what i prefer to do on youtube mm. and uh, obviously i've got my lovely ben to help me out with that <laughs> mm. um but yeah actually uh, I, I can i now can tell that obviously you're quite a big arsenal fan are you Ah uh, yeah, I, I, I'd I, I'd say that in terms of football was the first love and F one came in afterwards. Fair enough. Well, uh, that that makes me think we should probably should definitely get you on for uh, maybe a an Arsenal football based podcast in the future. Uh, <laughs> uh, only if you promise not to bully me. Although I think have been <laughs> I would... a little bit better recently. I have been. Uh, I'll try my best. I'm he's sure. A I'll. Fan, so he's he's the one that. Really <laughs> I'll give you the grief. I'll give you the grief. Um, actually, you know what? Let's have a little chat about Arsenal at the end of this. Um, <laughs> is there one YouTuber that inspires you currently? Currently. Uh, oh, uh, in terms of that, uh, in the F1 scene, I, I think all the ones you can kind of take. There's a load of inspiration from guys for different reasons. Like uh, I'd say there's new guys come up like Tomo F1 uh, for his graphic design and stuff like that. It's just kind of really slick in the way that he presents everything. And then there's this guy, Cranky Yankee F1, who's an uh, American guy. And honestly, his productions that he puts on, if it was like a documentary you saw about F1 on uh, TV, you wouldn't like bat an eyelid. It it really is that high quality. And then there's other guys who've been uh, going a long time, a couple of Geordie lads who I'm sure uh, it would be love to come on and have a chat with you guys uh, in Jordan and Lyle F1 debate show. They've been going for like four years talking about F1, but they're we've, we've actually kind of got, diehard Newcastle fans as well. You've actually got them uh, hopefully coming up in the next few weeks. There you go. <laughs> I, I <laughs> thought they would be uh, a great one as well. But yeah, th- those type of guys and obviously Sean, is the biggest from the F1 words is 100K. So those are the guys you kind of look up to, the top ones in the community, I'd say. Fair enough. Um, so like, again, with the more on YouTube, uh, like what is sort of the, your favourite thing or favourite type of video uh, that you do on, on YouTube? Um, like is there a particular like, a review of a race or something like that that you always a is it more the in-depth stuff? I, I, I quite enjoy like the in-depth podcasty chats. So obviously we, a similar sort of thing that you guys have done there, because I think it's interesting. Obviously you guys uh, obviously branching out, getting guests as well. And I imagine you do uh, you know, podcasts with just the two of you kind of having uh, chats about football as well. And that's that's kind of what we love doing and was the heart of it. You just that's kind of sport to me as a fan you it, it's kind of having after a game after a race whatever and you just kind of spend chatting about utter nonsense that comes by the time of the next week that you kind of becomes irrelevant or y- your opinion change you're so fickle like uh you'll say someone's terrible one week and then you go oh actually yeah what a great goal love them now <laughs> uh, but, but you, you know what i mean it's it, it's those kind of discussions and you always kind of interesting to hear other people's viewpoints on the on the same thing so those are definitely kind of the best videos fair enough um we're kind of building on on what you, you love to do now what what would you do differently 
if you could look back at your, your YouTube career that, that you've had, what would you do differently from back then? Or even would, like last week, <laughs> what would you do differently? Uh, I'm not too sure. Ob- obviously, differently is always the quality of it. But, you, mm. you know, it's... I, I went into it, I don't know, like you guys, but I had no kind of video experience or editing experience with it. Mm. Like, I, I No, I wasn't really a techie guy either. So I just kind of jumped in and it's been a learning curve along the way. So I, I suppose the only thing is differently is maybe doing a little bit more research into kind of lighting and stuff and microphones earlier on uh, for quality wise and going there and maybe sometimes not just releasing a video for the sake of it and focusing a little bit more on the quality. I, I think quality definitely is the the biggest thing uh, for people uh, going forward. Mm, well, uh, yeah, I completely agree with everything you just said there. Um, with us, we're trying to improve obviously our, our interviewing skills and mm. how we talk to people because obviously that's kind of, we didn't, we didn't start off with that kind of um, direction with this channel, but I mean, obviously things change and quality is, I have to say is like improving. I completely agree with you. Uh, for me with the, the editing and all that kind of stuff, I can do it. I, I've obviously been doing YouTube for six years now. Um, One, 20 channels. Yeah. I've had, I've had only two previous channels, only two previous channels. <laughs> well, you, you know, actually what happened. That's, that's a lie. Yeah, yeah, you like, <laughs> uh, I've had, I've had the odd, like, you know, mobile gaming, you just, I was bored every so often. <laughs> just, just play a game yeah. on my phone and upload it on a random channel. Um, <laughs> but the, but the main ones, the main, the main two, uh, you, you do literally have to just learn on the job, don't you? I mean, mm. um, we're still learning on this one. Like, well, as you can tell, Tom kind of directs the, the channel. <laughs> <laughs> just, just a little bit, just a little bit. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, can, I can completely get where you're coming from with the, you kind of go into it, you don't really know, and maybe you should have done a bit more research at the start, but I mean, the, the best way to to get good is to do. Uh, yeah. Do, do you agree with me on that? I, I think absolutely, and I, I think probably guys from more of a sporty background as well, we're always, uh, I think guys tend to kind of bring like, rather than kind of looking too much into things, we just kind of go, ah, screw it, let's yeah. just get it and see. <laughs> See, see, see what happens. And then like, uh, I think I was talking to on John's podcast yesterday, he asked me, you know, what was uh, and looked, looking back at like the first video and just going, yeah, you know, the first video, you're kind of awkward on camera and you're just like, uh, yeah, what? Um, uh, and you just kind of, that, that's one of the main thing. It's confidence. It, it's just kind mm-hmm. of going on a journey with it and knowing that if you just try and improve a little bit, each video, that's, that's probably the main thing. Yeah. I think, uh, like we were saying, like Tom directs the channel, but it's helped him having those other channels because he kn- now he knows what he's doing with this one, basically. Yeah. Um, and you, like you say, you um, you can you can do the editing, but it, like it's not like it's not well, the be-all, do, be-all, yeah. yeah, it's not what you want. It's not the be all and end all. Like you can still do these and not be worrying about editing, sort of thing. Yeah, hmm. definitely. Yeah, well, because with with this, I don't know if anyone who's watching this knows, we do literally just record the the Zoom call, and we kind of fo- we focus more on the content that we give out than like actually making it amazing. Maybe in the future, I'm sure me and me and Ben might invest in some some better quality equipment and maybe even an editor. Because I, I well, you might. <laughs> yeah, I might. Um, <laughs> if if the merch sales come through. <laughs> um but yeah uh, i completely agree with everything you were said. talking about doing like the cool window things weren't you yeah i had to look into that i don't know if mike you know um you know people do their zoom calls and they have like almost like a, a background to it with like yeah I, I i suppose no idea unless you kind of exported the zoom call to like a bit of editing we're, we're going to go technical on it <laughs> so I, straight over my head I, I know like so I do mine's very basic on like iMovie but and so I can only have two layers but I guess those guys are the ones who can have multiple layers mm-hmm. on it so you'd have like your video file and split the boxes 
of the Zoom call, and then you can yeah put a background overlay uh, on that as well, where you yeah. can kind of cut out the pieces to do that. So mm. that's probably how they do those. It's it's a lot of just adding layers and layers and layers of kind of editing stuff. Mm. It's become a fact finding mission for Tom, though. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you could say that. You could say that. Um, I mean, moving, like, moving on to last question. Um, do you have any future goals for your channel? Oh. Uh, I think it's just with anyone in terms of why do you start this? You go, you always want it to kind of grow, I suppose, into something and it'd be something cool that. I think everyone who starts a podcast or a channel or some sorts goes into it going, this would be cool if it could be something that's a job of some sorts. And like, it's a love of something. So it's a love of F1, a love of football for you guys uh, in terms of it. You want to go, it'd be cool there. But at the end of the day, I, it, it's making kind of friendships as well and kind of connections and talking to different people that you would have never have come across like I've done podcasts with people from America, Australia, New Zealand, Indonesia type things, talk about F1. You go, I never would have spoken to those people without the channel. So I suppose it's kind of meeting more people like that and then just seeing where we end up. Mm. No, yeah. I, I mean, I think probably me and Ben agree with that. We literally started this for fun. And uh, if it becomes a job, obviously that would be awesome, <laughs> I guess. But at the same time, it, it may not. So it's just kind of, we want to do it for some fun, really. Mm. So, yeah. Um, that's, that's kind of our YouTuber questions <laughs> segment done. Uh, that's, Ross, uh, out the hot seat, I'm done. <laughs> <I> was... <laughs> not yet, mate, not yet. <laughs> oh, God, oh, jeez. <laughs> uh, yeah, I want to start speaking to you about some Arsenal stuff. <laughs> how was it? Uh, how was the feeling on Saturday then? I was pretty good. I, I, it, it's weird um, with Mikel. I, I was very sceptical of Mikel when he came in because I was like, geez, we need an experienced head uh, at, at the team. Like Emery's come in and it started off well and then just went so, so badly really quickly. And I was like, we, we just, we're in car crash mode at the moment. We just need someone to come and steady the ship. We don't need to risk this young Mikel Arteta who has a great reputation going from there, but he, he's come and done a good job. And in one-off games, especially since the kind of uh, post-COVID games, obviously winning the FA Cup as well, uh, he, he proved pretty good. So yeah, Saturday was great, especially to be champions of the, the Liverpool smashed it. Um, and it was kind of a, it was that typical football cliche. It was a tale of two halves. I thought we were the better side in the first half. Mm. Liverpool came back strongly in the second half and then penalties, it's just a, uh, flip of the coin and Ryan Brewster. Uh, is it Ryan Brewster? Mm. Yeah. I, I might have got his name wrong. No, his so. name, but, um, but yeah, obviously he smashed it into the po uh, crossbar. So thank you for that. And uh, <laughs> obviously it means the Community Shield's a very worthwhile bit of silverware. Massive piece of silverware. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, they, it, it's good to start the season off with a bit of silverware. All right. Well, uh, you got anything else to add, Ben? Or... Um... I guess, uh, um, are you following like, the transfers and stuff for Arsenal? Uh, yes. And I, I suppose I, I used to be, I don't know about you guys, I used to be like one of those guys, you know, get excited about deadline day on Sky Sports, you know, Jim White with his bloody yellow tie and overhyping <laughs> everything in his very excited Scottish accent. Um and then you'd go, oh, wow, yeah. But I, I suppose when we started getting linked to like Benzema every year, and then it was like going, right, it's not, it's not happening, is it? And then the 40 million in one bid for Suarez or something stupid uh, <laughs> when we tried to do that. I, I kind of do it, but I kind of wait until we get announced. So obviously William uh, coming in is interesting. I was a bit surprised we offered him three years for a 32-year-old. Mm. Uh, but yeah, yeah. Certainly interesting on that front. So yes and no. Twenty thousand <laughs> pounds a week. Two hundred twenty thousand pounds a week. You've given him. Jeez, I, I don't even know if I know these figures are correct. I, I, I think <laughs> newspapers can get away with saying whatever they want. I mean, I, I really hope that obviously Meza Ozil isn't 
or Meza Ozil clearly is a lot this massive but you know that's probably like the maximum they get but I don't know if that's like within with clauses of appearance mm. fees goal bonuses of course yeah. assist bonuses stuff like that that overall it's that one but it might realistically be somewhere nearer the 160,000 a week I don't know yeah fair enough yeah. well uh, it was great having you on certainly we'll have you on for a proper Arsenal one in the future <laughs> and uh, I'm sure I'll try my best not to rinse you <laughs> <laughs> cheers mate thank, thank, thanks for being considerate <laughs> Uh, make sure you do check out Mike down in the description below. I'll have his link at the top. Uh, make sure you also check out the merch. We'd spent a lot of time designing this. I know it doesn't look like it from the front, but we did. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, if you like the video, please give it a like. That We'd really appreciate that. And subscribe if you're new around here. Thank you, Mike. And see you guys next week at Thursday, 4 p.m.